So today, here we go. Today's question is, how does our creation story compare to other creation stories? And we are going to be looking at a pretty good chunk of um, biblical text today that I did not put on the screen. So if you are the kind that likes to follow along visually, you'll want to grab a Bible. Otherwise, I will um, have it and, and um, present it off them. Or orally? <laughs> By mouth. Orally. Yes, orally. Not our orally is hearing. Anyway, um, so just have that in your mind as you proceed here. I got myself all discombobulated. All right. So how does our creation story compare to other creation stories? As usual, we'll start with our assumptions. And I have a few questions that I want us to consider as we start to think about this question. I'm going to use the word myth today. Our question doesn't use that word. They, it uses the word stories. But I think that the word myth is really important when we're talking about comparing creation stories because a story is um, one, you know, one, one format for a myth. But a myth is, um, I think, a, a, a better word to use when we're talking about this, this particular topic in that it, it, it's not about the format, it's about the content of, of the, the story or letter or poem or whatever it is. And so what is a myth? Well, in, in society in general, we kind of toss it around as a word that is derogatory. Oh, well, that's just a myth. That doesn't actually exist. But that's not really what myth is, is intent, intended to be about. Um, Mythology is about asking the big questions and trying to find the answers. Why does the world exist? What am I here for? Why do people suffer? These types of questions. Where did a particular type of um, behavior come from? Where did a particular type of tree come from? All those different types of questions about the world around us is where myths come from. Um, Typically, myths come in the form of symbolic narratives, so that's why we call them stories, but not always. Um, but myths are, are about always about answering these big questions. Um, myth has nothing to do with facts. And so when we say that's just a myth and we're comparing myth to facts, we are, we are doing a disservice to the concept of myth because mythology doesn't care about what's factual. Mythology is focused on truth with a capital T. And whether that truth is metaphorical or symbolic or historical, um, sometimes literal, but it, it, it goes beyond the concept of, you know, is something factual, is something, did something historically happen? It's bigger, bigger than Bigger truths, yeah. yes. It's bigger than that. And so to, to dismiss something as, myth, as a myth um, rather than you know, fact is, is I think to misunderstand the point of a myth. Um, and then finally, we, I think we as, as modern people need to understand that myth is different from science and it's, but it's also different from theology. Theology helps us to discern meaning through revelation. What do we know about God? What has God shown us about who God is? Science is about discerning meaning through experience or experiments and using our rationality to come to some, some um, conclusions or, or at least um, test hypotheses that, that we could hold um, more or less firmly depending on how, how often it's been, been tested. But mythology doesn't do either of those things. Mythology is about the symbolic narrative. It's about discerning truth through, through story, through these, these types of uh, metaphorical inquiries. And so when we look at myths, we need to be really careful that we understand them in their cultural context because the symbolism of the narrative is what is essential to understanding the myth and to answering the questions that it's asking properly. And so we can't use the assumptions of theology or science and impose those on the myth when we're trying to understand them. We need to look at where the story is coming from 
and why those questions might be asked by those by the people and kind of what are the questions that are being answered because a myth is almost like a conversation and and, and at some points you know it was um, children would sit sit at the knee of of their grandmother or whoever it was and ask questions where did the world come from well let me tell you but with the myths that we have today we kind of lose the conversation part of it we lose the inquiry and response part of it all we have most of the time is that story that's been put together and nicely pieced into you know something that makes logical sense and that's not the original um, way that a myth was was transferred myths are um, at, at their heart about oral tradition, about, uh, about relationship, about interacting with other people and passing on your symbolic knowledge through those stories. And so we need to just be careful when we're, when we're thinking about this um, today as we you know, start to do some of these comparisons. Uh, so any questions about what is a myth? We always said at church, a myth may not be true, but that doesn't mean it's not real. Correct. That's a good way to put it. Um, so now I wanna kind of dig a little deeper into the myth idea and focus particularly on creation myths. There are lots of different types of myths and we could, you know, we could talk about that and we could talk about how the, the Bible um, has, has lots of examples of all those different types of myths, but because this question asked specifically about creation, I wanna talk about what is the purpose of a creation myth or a creation story? And I think that there are multiple different things going on when it comes to why we would tell a, a creation story. Um, the first is to establish um, a reason or a justification for why things are the way they are now. And so we have these questions like, you know, where did the world come from? Or where did we as humans come from? Or we could have questions like I said before, like where did that tree, you know, what kind, where, where did that type of tree come from? Why is it so weird looking? Um, like the Joshua tree has a whole story to it. Uh, that's, a, that's a kind of creation myth. Um, you know, what, where, why do we have the relationship that we do with dogs? Um, any of those types of questions um, are part of kind of the, the creation myth because they help us to understand why things are the way they are currently. Um, creation myths also help to differentiate your group from other groups. When you make a statement within your symbolic narrative, within your mythology, you are attempting to express your particular cultural set of beliefs over against someone else's oftentimes, especially if you are in, you know, in, in a fairly new relationship with another group that has um, their own myth that is op opposed to yours in some way. Um, often, a group will uh, will will adapt their creation myth to show themselves to be superior in some way to an enemy, or will adapt it to show how a particular you know friend group is connected to them in some way. Mm -hmm. And so again, kind of justifying the current state of affairs, but also differentiating your group um, from other groups. And then also um, a creation myth helps to develop limits, give, give you the limits and frameworks for your life within that culture. Um, so, you know, the, the moral of the story kinds of things will, will pop up. Um, you know, why don't we go over there and um, jump in that big hole um, and, and check out what's in there. I'm really curious, or, you know, I don't know how many of you got to see the, <laughs> the Disney movie Moana. Um, why don't we go out into the ocean? Why don't we build a boat and, and go out further than, um, than the barrier reef? Um, well, instead of saying, well, we just don't, the answer is, well, let me tell you about, you know, the monsters that are out there. Let me tell you about the um, the, the experience of our distant ancestors in how um, it's you know, how it's dangerous out there. And so it, it helps to create um, those, those limits and, and barriers for people. Um, and so because of that, I think that creation myths are really important because what they are really doing 
with all of these different things is they are revealing who we are. They're revealing what is important to us. They are revealing what is not important to us. And so what a creation myth does at the end of the day is reveals to us our real priorities, despite what we might say about ourselves and our real prejudices, despite what we might say about ourselves. So when we look at a creation myth, it is telling us what the current state of affairs is, why it has to stay that way, and how we are different, usually superior to some other group. And so what is important to us? What are our priorities? How do we control the, um, the status quo? What are our prejudices is really what's going on with creation myths. So any questions or comments on that? All right, moving on. So then lastly, before we start jumping into actual creation myths and taking a look at some comparisons, I want to just run through with you um, the five categories of creation myth. And this is not the only way to differentiate these, but it's the most commonly accepted um, form. There are five different types of creation myths. Um, there are creation myths that are um, creation from nothing. So you have you know, some kind of um, actor who, um, who acts to create the world. Um, the Big Bang is actually, in a way, a creation myth from, uh, with, with this particular um, category imposed on it, creation from nothing. Um, then we have creation from chaos, which is kind of similar, but it's not, um, it's not quite the same. Creation from nothing describes you know, the nothingness and creation from chaos describes usually waters that are, that are ordered and land is brought out of the water and things like that. Uh, but some kind of, you know, primordial ooze or primordial gases or something um, that, that becomes um, order. And then the next set is um, a set that has um, two different directions, but kind of the same concept. Um, the first one is the emergence myth, where um, creation, or at least the people in creation, emerge from, um, from kind of under the ground and come out into the, the current world. And there's usually um, some kind of building with that. So it's not usually just one, um, you know, one, one source that pops out and everything is good. Um, and then we also have skydiver types of uh, creation myths, which is kind of the opposite direction. Um, usually there is some kind of bird or um, maybe um, some kind of water mammal, like a beaver or something like that. And they go down through the, the um, chaos of the water and you know, usually bring up some kind of mud or sand or, or silt or something. And that's what they use to establish um, the land and the creation um, starts to develop from that. And so we've got kind of this, this um, directional type of thing. And then finally, we have um, the category of the world parent. And these are the types of myths where the, the world is made out of the body or a piece of the body of some kind of uh, god or or um, you know mythological creature. So this is the kind of thing where um, you know some of them like the the one where the turtle you know the the, the world is uh, the the back of a turtle, and so we we live on the back of this turtle. Um, other um, other ones include you know some pretty gross stuff where like somebody's head gets cut off and that becomes the world or somebody's leg gets cut off and that's this aspect of the world and you know different things like that um there's there so there are there are non-violent ones and then there are violent ones um but the 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 idea being that the core of um the you know the the creation comes from and is is on this um you know this particular um, creature or god or whatever it is so I wanna just keep those in mind as we're going through um, some of these creation stories that we're gonna take a look at today. And we're not gonna be able to get to an example of all of these, but um, we'll, we'll do the best we can. So let's start with um, our creation stories. And the question I thought was interesting because the question says, um, 
you know, how does our creation story compare to other creation stories? But the problem is that we have several creation stories in our scriptures. And so which creation story are we talking about here? So I wanna start with, um, with the first version, which is the most commonly known version. It's the very beginning. And it is um, it appears in Genesis chapter one for the most part. So if you've got your Bible, you can flip open to that. If not, that's okay. You can just listen to uh, me read. And I'm not gonna read the entire thing because it's pretty long, uh, but I'm gonna give you a, a sense of it. And then I wanna talk a little bit about um, elements of it. So here's um, the first creation story from Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. God, so God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And then we have several more days. The third day is dry land and vegetation. The fourth day is the sun, moon, and stars. The fifth day is fish and birds. And the sixth day is land animals. And also then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. So there's our first creation story. And I wanted to just point out a few things about this um, that I think are interesting in relationship to comparative uh, mythology. Thinking about the very beginning of the story and how, what, what kind of creation myth this is. Our inclination because of theology might be to say, this is a creation from nothing story, right? Because we've been taught that God created the world out of nothing. But if you look at the actual text, this is not a creation from nothing story. This is a creation from chaos story. It says, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And then the creation begins with God saying, let there be light. And this is interesting uh, because this was never a problem for a long, long time um, until actually the Christians um, made it a problem. Um, not that there, 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 some Jewish um, factions had problems with it too, but in about the third century, it occurred to th some of the theologians that um, the idea of creation from chaos doesn't match with our understanding of who God is as, um, you know, as, as all powerful and all knowing and in complete control of all things. If God, um, if something exists that God did not create, then God is not the creator God. God is the organizer God, right? God is the, the ordering God. And that's not the God that we know. And so this, this concept of creation from nothing or in Latin, because they like to be fancy creation ex nihilo, 
um, developed. And so that's why we say that today, because we we have to, you know, we have to kind of try to find this, uh, find this system, find this um, internally um, cohesive and logical theology for ourselves. And over the course of time, as rationalism um, developed, it becomes more and more important to do that. But mythology doesn't care about that stuff. Mythology is not looking to, you know, to create an ordered theology and answer all these questions in that way. Mythology is trying to answer the question, the big questions. Why are we here? How did we get here? That kind of thing. And so it's kind of unfair to impose um, those theological necessities onto um, the myth of our creation story. Um, something else that I think is interesting that uh, makes, makes this particular um, creation story um, not, not solely unique, but a little different than a lot of the ones, especially that surround it, is that creation is spoken into existence. Many, many of the creation myths of the ancient Near East um, are have a lot of violence in them. And we're gonna look at an example of that uh, in a little bit, but um, not very many of them have, have to do with speaking um, creation into existence. And so the word of God is a fundamental um, piece of our understanding of who we are and, um, what the, what the world is all about and what our lives are all about, which is something that is not the case in a lot of other cultures that developed at the same time. Um, another thing that I think is really interesting and, and cool about this particular um, creation myth is that you notice when are the celestial bodies created? Anybody catch third that? Day. The third day. Yeah, not until later, right? I think it's let's right. see. Um, yeah, day four, sun, moon, and stars. Oh. And so this is this is a um, this is a statement of differentiation. This is a statement that the, the people of this god are not like, especially like the Egyptians. It's against, it's, it's, it's arguing against worship of the sun. Um, in the Egyptian create, one of the Egyptian creation myths, I shouldn't paint with broad strokes, there are lots of them, but one of the Egyptian creation myths um, comes from the cult of Heliopolis. And in this, in this particular um, creation myth, Atom, who is associated with Ra, which we might recognize as the sun god, um, existed in the primordial waters after creating himself. And then he um, gives birth, he engenders other gods that help to define and separate order from the chaos of the waters. And so he, um, he develops Shu, who is the air god and his sister. And then he and Shu have children called Geb, the earth god, and Nut, the sky goddess. And it goes on and on and on from there. And so the original god, is the God associated with the sun. And so in Egypt, you have a lot of sun worship. And it makes a lot of sense in this context of the ancient Near East to worship the sun, because what does the sun do? It gives you warmth, it gives you light to be able to see, it gives you the source of all the food that grows when there's not enough sunlight, you, you learn really quickly that you're not gonna be able to grow enough food to, to feed your, your culture. And so as soon as you become a, um, as soon as you become an agrarian society, as soon as you locate yourselves and stop um, following the bands of animals, the sun becomes really important. And so you get a lot of sun worshiping peoples from this, you know, from this era. But the, the Hebrews said, no, we don't believe that, that the sun is the source of all good. We believe that God is the source of all good. And look, within our creation myth, it says that the sun didn't even come around until it was almost ha over halfway done. And so it can't be the sun. It's got to be God. And God is not the same as the sun. Mm. So I think that's interesting and important differentiation. Um, in this particular story, as opposed to the one that we're going to look at next, humanity is the culmination of creation. God has already created everything else. It's there and ready 
to for the people to enjoy and be part of. And then of course, we also have the establishment of a day of rest. Um, and so we have kind of the, the answer to the question, well, where does this cultural ritual of taking off every seven days come from? Well, it comes from this, this creation myth. So all of these things are happening um, in this particular story. Any other comments, things that you noticed that are interesting to you? No. Um, well, I really um, like what you said about the word of God and about it was that word that created the world that we know, you know, yeah. the, um, I mean, that ties everything together, in my opinion, you know, that the word, of, that, was, that was all it took was mm -hmm. the word of God. Yeah. And words thought, are, words are important, right? To I thought that was interesting. And I, culture. and I do believe that um, most of this history is oral, you know, that people pass it down and and then it changes as it grows, but mm -hmm. um, but I like that it started with the word of God. I like that part of this. Yeah. When you speak in a way, your your words are creating the world, right? They're creating yes the truth. And so we have to be really careful about what we say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to um, creation myth number two from the Hebrew Bible. And this comes right after creation myth number one, starting with Genesis chapter two, verse four. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man, man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Pedalum and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is one that flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, eat of it, you shall die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed it up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. What are some things that you notice about this story that are different from the other story? This well, man hard. came first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is hard because we're kind of trained to um, to hear in these stories what we're supposed to hear. Which is kind of the 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 uh, the the, the coale coalescing of the two stories into one, um, but if you look at this story on its own, the man is 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 formed first, and then everything else comes. 
There is no garden, there are no plants, there's no water, there are no animals or birds. The, the, the man is formed first and then all of this other stuff is, is formed so that the man can enjoy it and, and um, use it for his, his edification. And the division of the man's um, creation from the woman's is different too, right? In the first story on day six, they're, born, they're, they're formed together, they're created together. But in this story, they're divided with all the other creation in between. So the man is kind of the, the first of the creation. And then the woman is the last of the creation, which you might say is, you know, the, the, the ultimate creation, the, the culmination of all of it. <laughs> the, after or thought. Do the other way. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> And so, um, so that's important. And it, it's interesting because there's no description of the land itself being created. It just says on the day that it happened, and then it moves on to the, 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 the formation of the man. On the day that God created everything, God created this man. And so it's interesting. You could read that, um, that creation from nothing category into it, maybe, um, because it doesn't really give a lot of details about that. Um, but it's not until the garden that we see any, you know, any descriptions of what God creates um, and in what order. So it's kind of, that's kind of an interesting thing. You can definitely tell this particular story is focused more on answering, um, you know, answering some of, some of the, the more technical questions, um, not, not getting that larger, larger story and, and that sweep of, um, of the whole experience. It's about, well, where did I come from? And how come we have all these different types of plants? And why, are you, why do we call giraffes giraffes? And why do we call elephants elephants? And those types of things are the questions that this, this particular one is an, trying to answer. So any other, um, any other comments on that one? Well, I have a question. Okay. If man wasn't born until Second Genesis. Who was documenting all of this? <laughs> so, yeah, that's why. So then, yep. if it was all in the memory of the first man, then this sort of becomes a myth, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it. So it. It. It's. I think that's the, the idea here. So um, by tradition, the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses. And he, you know, I guess sat down with God one day and God told him all the things to write down in this book, because obviously he wasn't alive when all of these things happened. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, where, where do these stories come from? And, and what, what is the, um, where is the grain of, of historical accuracy, if any, in these stories? Does it matter if there's any historical accuracy in these stories? Um, the first 11 chapters of Genesis uh, are called kind of the prehistory, and it isn't, it isn't um, called the history of the people of God until Abraham starts. Everything before that is, is understood to be more or less um, you know, mythological. Um, it's not, it's not about historically this happened this way. It's about what do these stories tell us about who we are? And so the creation stories, the fall, the flood, um, the, the um, Tower of Babel, these are the stories that, you know, we, we can say, I don't really care if this happened or not, because that's not the point. The point is not scientific investigation. The point is not historical fact. The point isn't even, um, necessarily, you know, what, what does this tell me um, about, um, you know, about how I can fit my, my fancy theological concepts together and have all these, you know, Latin words swirling around. The point is, how does this story fill me with understanding about who I am and who God is and who who the people around me are and what my, my place is within this wider world and what is the value of all the different pieces of it. 
and that um, you know that's what a myth is about. It seems to me that people have just always had curiosity, and there are so many questions we still can't answer, even with our with, with our science and mm -hmm. our telescopes. We still don't know. So these are just the ways people have tried to explain where we came from. And, and it's interesting that after thousands of years, we're still kind of adhering to some of these stories. Yeah, so. because I think I think they answer a deeper need. Mm -hmm. I think they answer they answer a deeper human um, need isn't the word I want. You know, human um, you know capacity or human human. Um, under something that makes you know something that makes us human, um, it it answers that 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 deeper. Um, I'll just use the word need. It's not exactly the word I wanted, but that that need to to understand more than just you know the physical facts. It it answers the you know the the psychological need, the um, the spiritual need, the emotional need that science can't answer and that you know theology as a as a kind of science in itself also really can't answer we can we can argue all day about how particular um, theological concepts fit together and we can create this beautiful structure of how all of our different ideas and understandings fit together neatly to create our concept of god but at the end of the day until we have that deeper connection to it until we have that moment of faith, that leap of faith that is required, you can't, um, you know, you can't connect it to anything um, that is part of that kind of intangible element of what it is to be human. It's not just about, you know, science and facts. We're looking for something deeper. We're looking for meaning. And that's different than what, um, what definitely what science and, and most of the time what theology can, can offer us. And so I think that's why we still cling to these stories, even as we understand that they aren't, you know, factually true, historically accurate. Yeah, but um, I have my own ideas about it, but how do you merge evolution with these stories? Um, that is a question that we have coming up, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh wait. Yes. What I will say for now is you don't, and you don't need to. And we'll talk more about that when when the okay. question comes up. Are we going to talk about about our relationship to the rest of the world? Is that going to be in one of the questions? What do you mean the rest of the world? We've talked about like non-Christians. No, 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 I mean I mean the natural world about like how creation. we need to keep everything going. For stewardship of creation going. yeah like we can't take away the bees they're important you know and yeah. the wolves are important and water is important so maybe that's a new part of the story a new understanding yeah and or I think stewardship be... is has has the, the 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 focus of stewardship maybe has changed over the last few years I don't know if it's been changed. I, I, I think we've always been charged with taking care of. But how we do it, Karen, seems to be changing. Well, yeah. So. All right. I put it. I wrote it down. I will go on the schedule. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now, surprise! I actually have a third creation story from the Bible for, to share with you. Um. This one comes from Psalm chapter 74, and you can read the whole, whole Psalm at some point if you're interested, but this is kind of the core of, um, of the story, excuse me. There are a couple of other places where there are similar types of things to this, but this is the, the most um, complete, if you will, uh, version of a, of a um, creation story. So Psalm 74 verse 12. Yet God, my king, is from of old, working salvation in the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the head of the dragons in the waters. 
you crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the, wild, of the wilderness. You cut openings for springs and torrents. You dried up ever flowing streams. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You established the luminaries and the sun. You have fixed all the bounds of the earth. You made summer and winter. And then it does go on a little bit more. So that kind of gives you the sense of it. So this is a really interesting one. Um, we don't tend to understand this as a creation myth, but it is. And if you take it on its face, it's very different than what we see in the other story. And even knowing what I know and having the perspectives that I have, I can feel my brain working right now to explain this in relationship to kind of the standard story that I was taught as a child, because that's just like part of our, um, part of our defense mechanism when we come across something like this, that, um, that is contrary to, you know, that, that kind of baseline understanding of, of God. Um, and I can, I can feel it, you know, in my head right now, like I want to say, oh, well, this is just, you know, another, another way of expressing the ideas of what was going on, because it does have the same kind of elements. It talks about dividing the sea and, and, you know, the, and that God did do that. And it's just, you know, using different words and different images and different metaphors and things like that. But it, but you have to try, and I have to try to take this for what it is. So it says that God divided the sea and battled with dragons using this Leviathan, this primordial serpent creature to feed the de developing, the, the, the um, creatures that God has created in the wilderness. Um, then there's also this, this other kind of violence that God is doing. God is cutting open places for springs and torrents to run, but also drying up other streams. Um, God established the stars and the sun, which yes, that fits in, and fixed all the bounds of the earth and then the origins of the seasons. And so we've got this interesting, um, almost contradiction in some ways to the, the stories that we have at the beginning of our Bible. And you have to notice where these things are placed to and which ones we wanna emphasize and which ones are you know, of most importance to us in our faith. Um, this one's tucked away in the Psalms versus the other ones that are right there at the beginning. But um, how different is it that in one place, you know, God speaks, God breathes, God um, molds, God does creative things versus here, God is battling, God is doing violence, God is destroying some things in order to make space for the um, the, the the new creation this the way that things are now um there is a place here that you know seems to suggest that um the sun and the stars have some kind of level of of domination or you know import that they're they're pointed out as opposed to a lot of other things and then we have you know the the idea of the flow of seasons and and kind of establishes why we, um, you know, why we have winter, why we have summer, or in some places, why we have dry seasons and, and wet seasons and things like that, that God is, is in control of all of those things based on God's manipulation of um, the earth and, and, this, and in some ways, violent manipulation of the earth. So an interesting, an interesting take on it, for sure. What do we think about this one? I think it's kind of fun thinking about dragons and <laughs> stuff. Um, I, I, you know, they didn't have a lot of scientific explanations for anything back then. Um, the psalmist would probably just make it up, making up some stuff to make it more interesting. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's just more of a human, a human sense of how you do these things. Maybe by the time this was written, people were out there battling and that's how they imagined it, it was projection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, what do we do when we create? Like when we build a city? Well, we go out and we 
divert streams and we cut into the mountainside and we, um, you know, we, we, we force the, the landscape to be the way that we want it to be so that we can put in what we want to put in. And so this, this particular description of creation kind of falls into that in a way. All right, so that was our sweep of the creation stories that are the our creation story part of the question. So now let's get to um, get to the heart of it. And I have um, I just picked out two um, creation stories. You know, every culture has its own creation story. So we could literally talk about this every single week um, for a year and not get to all of them. Um, but I, I picked out just two examples of um, stories that I think are interesting to compare and talk about a little bit. So the first one is the Babylonian creation epic, which is um, the, the story of um, the Enuma Elish. And we have actually talked about this a little bit um, in, in the past, when back when we were doing um, our violence in the Bible class. But I wanted to, to take a look at this um, with you a little bit today. And what I'm going to do is, because this is unfamiliar to us, I do have the text for us to, to look at and follow along with. And each time um, we run out of room, I want to just pause and kind of talk a little bit about how what's happening in this particular section compares to our creation stories. So here we go. When the in the height of heaven was not named and the earth beneath did not yet bear a name and the primeval Apsu who begat them and chaos Tiamat, the mother of them both, their waters were mingled together and no field was formed, no marsh was to be seen when of the gods none had been called into being and none bore a name and no destinies were ordained. Then were created the gods in the midst of heaven. Lamu and Lahamu were called into being. So what I notice about this is it starts with a timing phrase, just like ours, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, when in the height of heaven was not named. And it's got some other similarities. The earth was formless and void, we say. We have kind of the same thing. Waters were mingled together, no field was formed, no marsh was to be seen, nothing had been called into being. And so there's this concept of kind of the spirit hovering over the waters, right? Their waters were mingled together. And this part's really interesting to me. There's this passive voice um, for, the, for the very first act of creation. Then were created the gods in the midst of heaven. Lamu and Lahamu were called into being. And so who created them? Because we're using this passive voice, we don't know. I guess we can assume that it was Tiamat and Apsu, and most people, you know, most most people do. Um, chaos, Tiamat is chaos, the, the, the concept of chaos. And so from chaos is born the first of the gods. So interesting. Any comments that anything that any of you see here that I didn't catch? It does kind of follow, um, but I, I'm i with you. I, this passive voice and then all of a sudden some some gods were created. I don't, yeah. it's kind of, kind of confusing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's keep going. So the next section says, ages increased, but Tiamat and Apsu were still in confusion. They were troubled and in, in disorder. They prepared for battle, fuming and raging. They joined their forces and made war. Tiamat, who formed all things, made in addition weapons invincible. She spawned monster serpents, sharp of tooth and merciless of fang. With poison instead of blood, she filled their bodies. Fierce monster vipers she clothed with terror. With splendor she decked them. She made them lofty of stature. Wow. So what I notice here is uh, first, I think that the first line ages increased is super interesting because this is a long time over which all of this stuff is happening. Whereas in our first, um, our first 
one that we saw in Genesis one, it takes seven days. And then in the second one, it seems like it happened all in one day. And so there's, um, there's this, this differentiation of, um, of how long this takes and um, the, I, I, even the intentionality, I think of it, that God, God is in control and in charge and God says, okay, I'm going to do this. And then God just does it. And whether it takes one day or seven days, depending on, you know, which, inter- which story you're looking at, it's not the same as ages. There's an intentionality, there's a motivation, there's a control over this, the process that does not seem to be present um, in this one. Um, also, I, I want to compare what's going on in this passage with the, the repetition of what God, um, how God um, s- says it is good. When God's creating, the things that God creates are good. Well, Tiamat is clearly not creating things that are good, or at least not only things that are good. We've got these awful serpent, monster serpents and vipers and poisonous blood and merciless fangs and all of these awful things that are being created. So it's not good, right? It's, it's bad, it's evil, it's ferocious. It's, um, it's something that's wrong in, in the creation. And so um, this is from, there are, there are several tablets of this story. And um, I, I'm just gonna give you kind of a, a quick summary of what's happening so that we can move on to the next section. Um, in the second tablet and in the third tablet, the sons of Tiamat, the um, Lamu and Lahamu, try to defeat Tiamat. They try to, um, first they try to battle her, that doesn't work. Then they try to um, kind of use their words and, and coddle her and convince her to stop being so evil and chaotic. And that doesn't work. And so what they do is they create an Avenger and the Avenger's name is Marduk. And they are setting Marduk up so that he can battle with Tiamat on their behalf and end this nightmare that she has created with all of these awful monsters that she's put out there. And so we, um, we get to the scene where Marduk is being prepared for his, his battle. It says, they rejoiced and they did him homage saying, Marduk is king. They bestowed upon him the scepter and the throne and the ring. They give him an invincible weaponry which overwhelmeth the foe. Go and cut off the life of Tiamat and let the winds carry her blood into secret places. And the gods his fathers had decreed for the Lord his fate, after the gods his fathers had decreed for the Lord his fate, they caused him to set out on a path of prosperity and success. He made ready the bow, he chose his weapon. He slung a spear upon him and fastened it. He raised the club in his right hand and he grasped it. The bow and the quiver he hung at his side. He set the lightning in front of him. With burning flame, he filled his body. So I think this is an, another interesting contrast. Think about the peacefulness of God's creation. God speaks creation into being. It's not about war, it's not about battle. And I think this is interesting too. How does God prepare to create? What does God do in order to, to create? Does God get battle ready? Does God put on all the, all the armaments? No. What does God do? God just opens up the mouth and here it comes. The spirit of God is hovering over the waters and the deep. And God says, let there be light. And then all of a sudden it just happens. So definitely some contrast there. Well, how did all these people get there? They, they are, they are formed. So La, Lamu and Laha, Lam, Lam, Lamu and Lahamu are the sons of Tiamat. And so they then, you know, start to develop more and more gods. It's all incestuous. And <laughs> I know, but, but it doesn't even say how Tiamat and the other one got there. No, it doesn't. They're, they're just there from the beginning. They just, they just sprung out. <laughs> I guess. I guess so. <laughs> it's confusing. Yes. <laughs> all right. So moving on. When Tiamat heard these words, that Marduk was going to come and attack her and kill her, she was like one possessed. She lost her reason. T- 
Tiamat uttered wild piercing cries. She trembled and shook to her very foundations. She recited an incantation, she pronounced her spell, and the god of the battle cried out for their weapons. Then advanced Tiamat and Marduk, the counselor of the gods, to the fight they came on, to the battle they drew nigh. The Lord spread out his net and caught her, and the evil wind that was behind him he let loose in her face. As Tiamat opened her mouth to its full extent, he drove in the evil wind, while as yet she had not shut her lips. The terrible winds filled her belly, and her courage was taken from her, and her mouth she opened wide. He seized the spear and burst her belly. He severed her inward parts. He pierced her heart. He overcame her and cut off her life. He cast down her body and stood upon it. Ooh. He split her up like a flat fish into two halves. <laughs> One half of her he established as a covering for heaven. He fixed a bolt. He stationed a watchman. He bade them not to let her waters come forth. He passed through the heavens, he surveyed the regions thereof, and over against the deep, he set the dwelling of the Nudimod, <laughs> which is the word for creation. Nudimod. So you have some things, you know, you have some elements that, that are familiar here. Um, he uses Tiamat, half of Tiamat, to hold back the waters in the heavens. And then he uses the other half to, um, to maintain the waters below. So we have that, you know, God divides <laughs> the waters above from the waters below to create the space for the land and the creation to, to live and be and exist. So we've got that, um, you know, that connection. But think about all this other wild stuff. Um, yeah. He uses, you know, he uses her body parts. So this is, this is the example of the um, world parent type of mythology where the, the, the God the body of the god is used to um, to create the creation, um, but there's this this very you know physical uh, violence that happens here in order for um, for the the creation to um, to come to, into being, and Marduk has to do all of these things in order for creation to exist. So what uh, what am I missing here? Any interesting? Thoughts from anybody else? That's quite a story. It is. <laughs> and that's just part of it. It's very long. And then some of some of the pieces are missing or they're like, you know, scratched off that you can't see all of them. That's where all those dot dot dots were in the story. So it's uh it's it's kind of hard too because we don't have a a full copy of the whole story to look at, but you kind of get the get the idea, which is interesting. So that is the Babylonian um, creation epic. And so that, you know, I picked that one because it's, it's close to, um, close to the physical, you know, geographical location of um, where our creation stories come from, of course, which is from the, the land of Israel. Uh, but now I wanna do one that's just completely separate, completely different, just for the sake of interesting and fun um, to, to kind of take a look at what other options are out there. Because like I said before, um, creation myths are there to um, tell us who we are, to um, express, you know, why things are the way they are, and therefore they reveal to us our priorities and our prejudices. And so if we look at one that's very different, then maybe we can have an opportunity to pharaoh out, for, for, yeah, no, bear it out. There we go. That was what I was looking for. Um, some of those priorities and pre uh, prejudices that we might have. So this is the Hopi creation myth. So the Hopi are um, the people of the um, American West, uh, North American West. And so their, um, their creation myth is as follows. When time and space began, the sun spirit Tawa created the first world in which insect-like creatures lived unhappily in caves. With the goal of improvement, Tawa sent a spirit called Spider Grandmother to the world below. Spider Grandmother led the first creatures on a long trip up to the second world in which they took on the appearance of wolves and bears. As these animals were no happier than the previous ones, however, Tawa created a new third world and again sent Spider Grandmother to convey the wolves and bears there. By the time they arrived, they had become people. 
After evil broke out amongst the people in the third world, with the help of spider grandmother or bird spirits, a hollow bamboo reed grew at the opening of the third world into the fourth world. This opening, Sipapu, is traditionally viewed to be the Grand Canyon. The people with good hearts or kindness made it to the fourth world. In this fourth world, the people learned many lessons about the proper way to live. They learned to worship Mas Masawu, who, en who ensured that the dead returned safely to the underworld and who gave them the four sacred tablets that in symbolic form outlined their wanderings and their proper behavior in the fourth world. So this is a, this is a summary of, of that story because these are still um, stories that are told um, orally. And so we don't have you know, a, 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 an original copy of this um, and we don't want it. You know, people, the Hopi people um, don't want their stories to be codified in such a way that they um, remain rigid. It's part of the, the cultural process for them. Are we in the fourth world or is that to come? No, this is the fourth world. Okay. And so they have, you know, they have the, the proper behaviors, they have the understanding of um, how they're, who they're supposed to be. And they understand that this is, you know, this is where, um, this is, this is where, this is our fourth try, you know, where um, the, the benevolent God, Tawa, um, has established, this is now the fourth world that has been established in order to help us with our, you know, to improve and to um, be happy because as it, as it said before, the in insect-like creatures were miserable and needed something more. And so they were given, they were given this. So interesting um, with, this, with this particular myth, there are lots of different things that I think are interesting in comparison, um, but emergence myths are really much more common among Native American cultures. They're not exclusive to Native American cultures. Um, there are some in like Eastern Europe as well. Um, but think about the, the cultural emphases of a tribe like the Hopi and how the emer kind of a, the emergence myth is a much more um, female oriented type of myth. It um, is, it's, it's kind of a symbolic birth. Um, the, like this hollow bamboo reed Thing where they traveled through from the third world into the fourth world is, is kind of like a, a birth canal kind of symbol. And so the, the birthing of a new world, the birthing of creation is um, kind of draws on the, the birth experience of a human. Whereas other types of, of creation myths like that from nothing creation myth um, focuses more on um, on the, the male power, on the power of, you know, the brain or the, the words or, um, you know, the, the magic kind of stuff, the, you know, pop it into existence or, you know, violently control the chaos and, and those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think this one's interesting too, because it's got this process to it. It's not, you know, the, 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 the concept of, um, and, and I think if we if we brought in like the flood story maybe into into the creation myth um, and and extended it out, maybe we could you know talk a little bit about that. But the process of development and the read birth into an improved state is interesting to me because it it kind of helps to establish the the idea that you know it's it's not just like this and it doesn't have to always be like this. Um, this is actually, you know, as we've moved through and improved ourselves and, and this God has helped us along the way to um, coming to, you know, coming to these places of, um, of a, a better understanding of who we are and how we ought to behave and how we ought to treat the creation and each other and, and things like that, um, then we, we develop into, you know, who we are now. And so there's that goal of self-improvement, that goal of living well in community together which of course are you know, pretty common um, tropes from, from Native American cultures in general um, that when white colonists came and um, kind of invaded all of that, it, you know, that started to change things. So I, I, I'm interested, I would wonder you know, what, what the Hopi um, creation myth has done in its oral telling 
you know, in the last couple hundred years as um, the, the, the way that the world looks and um, the Hopi's place in it has, has changed. I'd be interested to hear about that. Hmm. Um, anything that you, that, that was of note to you in this story? wonder why they picked a spider. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of stuff with, with weaving and spiders are often wise in, in these stories. Maybe, you know, to do with patience, with, with the weaving and waiting for the prey and that kind of thing. Oh, okay. Other fifth world? I don't Eventually. know. Or I don't this know. is it. I don't know. To them. And, yeah. and um, it says the four sacred tablets that were in symbolic form. Um, that means they weren't in words, right? They mm -hmm. were, mm -hmm. they were um, pictures. And uh, I remember when our kids were younger, um, we um, took a trip. We were going through um, Arizona and New Mexico, and there were some caves there that you could see the handprints of the people who who formed it in the clay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the pictures. And um, of course, they had to eventually close it because people were destroying the, the stuff, but um, I could see that they would have tablets made out of clay. I mean, that makes sense to me that they mm. would um, they they would do that way. I'd like to see it. Yeah, I don't I'd know. I'd like to know anything, more about it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if anything that claims to be those four sacred tablets still exists, or if that's just part of the part of the mythology, but that's interesting. Yeah, it's part of the symbolism, probably. Yeah. But, it, um, but it's interesting. A, there's a um, an author slash compiler named David Leeming, L-E-E-M-I-N-G, who does a lot with um, Native American mythology. And so if you're interested in learning more about it, that might be a place to start to look up some David Leeming books. OK. All right, so I could have gone on all day, but I will not. I'll stop there and we can wrap <laughs> up our wrap up our uh, conversation for today. But I encourage you if you have, you know, if you have a particular um, uh, you know, genealogy that you know of that would be interesting. Every culture has a, you know, a, a creation myth. Um, and the one that we adhere to as Christians is um, not necessarily the only one that can can give us interesting in um, interesting uh, uh, insight into, you know, who we are and how the world ought to work. So I, I encourage you um, to, to read lots of myth um, because it's, it's fascinating and helpful, I think, and as we try to figure out what this world is about and how we, how we fit into it. Uh, but for today, we can, we can wrap it up and come back around to our question, how does our creation story compare to other creation stories? Well, I think it both fits in because it has the same purpose. It fits into those categories with other types of creation myths. But in some ways it also stands out. It contrasts the Jewish people or the people of Israel against others in their region. Um, it contrasts their philosophical priorities. It contrasts um, you know, that, that deep belief in just the one God opposed to other cultures that had um, a, a pantheon. Um, I think that there is evidence in our um, in our in our creation myths and creation stories of influence from other cultures. Um, you know, we we have that kind of interpretation of chaos being defeated, like the Tiamat chaos in in the um, in the Babylonian myth. Um, we don't, you know, there's there's no um, personification of that chaos in our story, but 
especially in that Psalm one that there kind of is with the, with the, the Leviathan, you can kind of see some similarities there with the Tiamat um, destruction and ripping her apart in order to um, make space for and, and um, feed the, the new creation. And also I think, um, you know, thinking about what are some of our priorities and what are some of our prejudices? Like I said, that's really what creation myths are about. And I think that um, some of our priorities and, and prejudices are, are pretty clear if we think about it. Um, you know, the power of our words to affect our understanding of reality and to affect the way that we um, kind of create reality for ourselves, I think is, is a priority for us because of our creation myth. Um, the idea that creation is good. Creation is not opposed to God. Creation is not opposed to goodness. Um, indicates that, you know, the, the, the world is a place to, um, to be trusted. The world is a place to find beauty and find evidence of God. Um, but it also kind of points me, you know, to some of the conversations that we've been having, like against the Greek understanding of the world. There is no such thing as a soul body dichotomy. That which is physical, that which is earthly is good. God declares it so. And so we have to keep that in mind as we are um, engaging with the world and we don't, you know, we don't abuse our bodies. We don't abuse the bodies of others. We don't abuse our physical world because it is God's good creation and it's not opposed to the spirit and, and we're not looking to escape from, you know, our, our evil and um, moldy, gross bodies someday. Our bodies are part of the goodness of God's world. I think that's important. Um, it definitely emphasizes that God is a completely in control. There are no powers equal to God. God does not have to battle and fight for the right to develop the world into what God wants it to, to look like. God just does it because there is no other God but God. There is no other power but God. Um, but then I think, you know, we do have some prejudices, certainly, and that, that are available to us if we look um, look with the eyes to see. There are definitely some gender biases that are present in our creation stories, especially the second one, dividing male and female from one another in the way that they were created. And I think that, you know, helps to, um, helps to, to give additional credence to some people who want to maintain those types of um, biases and, and differentiations, um, which is harmful to both men and women, I think. Um, the idea that humanity is superior to all other things, other, all other created things, whether it's because we are the um, ultimate creation and, and we're saved, we save the best for last, or whether it's because you know man was created first. Um, either way, I think we need to be careful that we see our position in the creation as a responsibility and not as a privilege that can be abused. And now we can talk about that as a whole other topic at some point. And I think too, the value of rest and reflection over the value of maximizing economic gain is certainly a part of our cultural tradition with the creation story that we have. God reminds us that rest and reflection and um, making space to, to um, feed our spirituality and our, psych our psyche is really important, even if it means um, you know, giving up on some of the potential economic or, or social gain that we might get from working 24 hours a day. And I think that's something that's an, a value, an important value of our, um, our culture that we have to try to maintain, even in the face of uh, cultures that are around us that say otherwise. So to wrap us up today, I've got Colossians chapter one, verses 15 through 17, which tells us he, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things and in him, all things hold together. So when we think about our creation myth as Christians, not just as, as part of the tradition of the Jewish people, but as Christians, we have to put Christ at the center. And that makes us different from everybody else, right? 
the idea that this person, this, um, this, this God man, this representative of God is at the center of all things. And it is for him that the creation exists. It is through him that the creation exists. And so it is he that we can look to, to hold things together. And so we have that confidence that it's not, you know, it's not some violent and um, potentially sporadic um, Marduk type of guy who is, is the source of our hope and our security and our salvation. It is the God who speaks, the God who, um, who molds and creates the God who is intentional and motivated and, um, you know, will, will never betray us. So that's what I have for this week. Questions, comments, disagreements. I have a question. Okay. You, you mentioned that the soul and the body are not separate. And, um, and I agree with that, but, um, I'm thinking, does that mean, I'm thinking about the uniqueness of the individual and, and all of the things that make up the, the physical body as well as the soul. I mean, that means that God created both, mm -hmm. right? And um, I don't know where I'm going with this. I, so, you really need to um, admire the um, the individuals around us. I mean, everyone then being created in God's image and being who they are, we need to appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, I think that's an that's an important element that um, you know in the image of God, they, they were created is, is a statement of the value of, yes. every, of every human. Yeah. And that means every human. Yeah. Right. Right. Every human. Even in every Florida. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's kind of cool. Yeah. When you think, you know, when you think about creation and you think about this person, well, like um, my cousin's daughter just has a new baby, and um, he is just this. I haven't seen him except in pictures, but he's just this perfect little human, you know, and you just marvel. I mean, I mean maybe that's why we get so sappy about babies, but. <laughs> um it's just a miracle it really yeah. is a miracle mm -hmm. and nobody could do that but god yeah okay yeah it's true anything else thanks katie welcome thank you katie i gotta go all right so thing. next week's question is what is christian pacifism uh -huh. Oh, wow. Well. Interesting timing for that, given that we didn't know that there was going to be a war when we scheduled that, but we'll talk about it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great week. It's Sunday. See you Sunday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.